Our next guest is one of the leading academics in the world with several patents under his belt. Let's watch a short video about his life. Ladies and gentlemen, Nariman Farvardin. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I am honored to be here. Uh, this beautiful video that I was watching from backstage uh, reminded me of uh, a very interesting story that I heard from a very good friend of mine, Mr. Norm Augustine, who's one of the uh, foremost CEOs uh, in the United States. Uh, he, the story goes like this. Uh, a number of years ago, this is probably 30, 40 years ago, uh, Mr. David Roderick was the um, CEO and chairman of U.S. Steel, which was a major corporation at that time in the country. And uh, he used to give a lot of public speeches like this, uh, in one of the um, speeches, the master of ceremonies uh, introduced Mr. Uh, Roderick. He said, uh, Mr. Roderick is one of the foremost businessmen in the country. He's one of the most brilliant businessmen. And in fact, in a recent transaction, um, an oil-related transaction in California, he made $10 million in one transaction. And then he proceeded to ask Mr. Roderick to take the, the stage, Mr. Roderick was very grateful. He thanked the master of ceremonies for the kind introduction, but he was a little uncomfortable. He said, uh, I feel obliged to make a small correction. Uh, the $10 million oil transaction in the state of California that uh, was just re uh, discussed uh, was actually not in the state of California, it was in Pennsylvania. And then he said, it actually was not an oil transaction, it was actually a coal transaction. <laughs> and then he proceeded to say, the person who was involved in the transaction was actually not me, it was my brother. <laughs> and then he continued to say, the amount actually was not $10 million, it was only $10,000. <laughs> and finally he said, he actually didn't make $10,000, he lost $10,000. <laughs> So, I suggest you take this video with a grain of salt. Thank you. Uh, now that I have successfully broken the ice and made the audience comfortable, uh, let me say that I am honored uh, for this incredible recognition tonight by Paya. Uh, I am grateful to all of the people who have worked so incredibly hard over the course of the past many months to organize this event. I'm especially thankful to Ms. Sari Arakhan, who uh, first contacted me, I don't remember when that was, maybe in April or May, and uh, I am uh, grateful to her for all the work that she's done uh, for uh, this period of time. 
Uh, let me also take advantage of this opportunity to offer my own personal congratulations to all of the honor honorees uh, who are being recognized tonight whose accomplishments are far more impressive than, than my own. Since I don't have very many opportunities to speak in an Iranian-American uh, audience, uh, let me use this opportunity to thank a few people who have played a very profound role in uh, shaping my character and in influencing my life. Uh, I'd like to start with my parents, my loving and caring parents, who gave everything they had so selflessly to raise uh, my sister and me. I know my parents are somewhere here, and I just want to tell them I remain in your debt forever. <laughs> my sister, my brother-in-law, my niece and nephew, I love you very much. Thank you for your love in good times, and thank you for your support in the times of difficulty. And my beautiful wife and daughter, who are also somewhere here in the audience, thank you for everything you do for me. Thank you for your uh, unbounded love and unbounded patience with my uh, eccentricities. Uh, uh, Winston Churchill, a man for whom I have a lot of uh, admiration, once said, uh, my most brilliant accomplishment in life was to marry my wife. And if Winston Churchill was alive, I would have told him, Sir Churchill, you're not alone. Thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Remember, this picture will come back to this, but can we go to the next one? So I have prepared a talk that is actually very brief in terms of the main messages I have. I will tell you about my own journey in life. I will tell you about four experiences that I consider as watershed events in my life that shaped my personality and many of my decisions. And, I'll, uh, and then I'll leave you with, with a few lessons in life and leadership that might be of use to some of the younger generation here. Next slide, please. This is where my, my wife, my life started. In 1956, I was born in Tajrish, which at the time was a relatively small village in the northern part of Tehran. That's the picture in the top left. And this is where my life is today, in Hoboken, New Jersey, right across from Empire State Building. The contrast between these two pictures is a reflection of the vast change that has taken place in my own personal life. Next slide, please. So I was born in 1956 in a small clinic in Tajrish, as I said, to loving parents who were very young and they had very modest means. My father in that year graduated from Tehran University from the School of Dentistry. The middle picture is my picture with my mother and the picture on the right is my picture with my grandmother for whom I was the first grandchild and you know how grandmothers deal with the first grandchild. Next slide, please. I was only two years old when my parents decided that for work-related reasons, they had to move to Kermanshah. Kermanshah, for those of you who are not familiar with the geography of Iran, is a small city in the, maybe no longer it's small, but at the time it was a relatively small city in the southwestern part of Tehran, about 525 kilometers from Tehran, not too far from the Iran-Iraq Iraq border. Kermanshah is rich in its natural beauties, and it has a tremendous amount of history uh, from uh, the period before Islam. Next slide, please. Can we have the next? Yes. So I grew up in Kermanshah. I, uh, I grew up there to be 17 years old. As you can see, I have different pictures of uh, various phases of my, uh, of my life. Uh, one thing that became very clear early on in my uh, journey in that city was that the education system in that city was inadequate and certainly far behind that of bigger and more advanced cities in Iran. Can we go to the next slide? I had a memorable experience when I was 11 years old that I thought I would share with you. We had a math teacher who was trying to teach us uh, 
long divisions. Now, some of you may remember the days we learned long division. And at some point during that year, she wanted to teach us how to do long divisions of decimal numbers by decimal numbers. So I've given you an example here. You have a dividend, you have a divisor, and then you compute the quotient, and sometimes there's a remainder. And unfortunately, the education system there was so bad that our math teacher didn't quite know how to do this. So she was teaching us a formula for how we should determine where the decimal point should be placed in the remainder. But I was very bad with memorization. She was telling us, you count the number of places uh, of the decimal point in the dividend, and then you count the number of places for the divisor, and then you add one, and then you subtract two. I simply cannot remember. And then you put the decimal point in the remainder. So sure enough, we had an exam. They gave us a, a problem like this. I worked it out. And to me, the natural way of determining where the, uh, how the remainder should be computed was to multiply the quotient by the divisor and subtract it from the dividend, and that would give you the remainder. So that's what I did to determine the remainder. Well, I got my exam back, and I did not have the full score. I took it back home and I showed it to my father. My father examined my, uh, my work, and he said, well, you're right. Uh, so I took it back to my teacher, and the teacher said, no, you haven't followed the formula. Actually, your answer is not right. So we went back and forth a few times. I remember vividly my father had to come to school and speak with the principal of the school. <laughs> and uh, so there was a session, uh, there was a consultation session, and at the end they determined that actually my answer was correct. The math teacher's approach was incorrect. And uh, that experience instilled a sense of confidence about my own math skills in me. But at the same time, it, it sent a message, and the message was that there is something wrong with the education system. Just so you know, the situation got, uh, went from bad to worse. When I went to high school, I had a teacher in the seventh grade that taught me math. The very same teacher became our English teacher in the eighth grade. <laughs> and in the ninth grade, he taught geography. <laughs> Quite frankly, he wasn't good in any of the three subjects. As a result of that, my parents decided that I should not stay in Kermansha and complete my high school studies. We were, at the time, all worried about getting to college. If you remember, there was this college entrance exam called Concours. So if you could go to the next slide. So when I was 17 years old, I left my family from Kermansha. I went to Tehran, and I... Uh, enrolled in high school for the last year of high school, and then I was admitted to college. I went to what was then called Aryamar University of Technology. The name today is Sharif University of Technology. And uh, as many of you remember, this coincided with the, uh, with the uh, revolution, with uh, um, uh, demonstrations and massive strikes that basically paralyzed the country. And in 1978, after consultation with, with my parents, I decided, and after the university was completely shut down, I decided to transfer from Iran to the United States. Can we go to the next slide? And this slide shows the next phase of my journey that started in upstate New York on the bank of the Hudson River in January of 1979. I started my studies at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I uh, finished my studies at RPI, and in 1983, having received my uh, doctoral degree, I uh, secured the position as an assistant professor at the University of Maryland. Can we go to the next slide? And that transitioned me from Troy, New York, to the Washington, D.C. area at the University of Maryland. If you could go to the next slide. This was a very significant part of my life. I stayed in the Washington, D.C. area and at the University of Maryland for 27 and a half years, exactly one half of my life. From 1983 to 1994, I was an assistant professor, then an associate professor, and then I became a full professor. During this period of time, my energy was completely focused on my teaching and my research endeavors. In 1994, as you saw in the video, I became 
chair of the department, and I'll talk about my transition from being a faculty member to an academic administrator. In 2000, I became dean of the School of Engineering, and in 2007, I became the senior vice president for academic affairs and provost. Next slide. Until three months ago. Three months ago, I made yet another journey from Washington, D.C., back to the Hudson River, this time to Hoboken, New Jersey. The picture that you see in the middle shows the campus of the university where I'm the president of. If you see the, the part of the picture in the middle that is closer to you, there's a tall building. My office is actually on the top floor of that building. And if you see the picture on the left, there is a reason I have that picture here, which was on the very front page of my slides also. You see the picture of the, the, the statue of a man on a horse bending downwards to grab a torch of success from a man who's handing that torch representing the educational uh, experience that he has received to the man on the horse. And I figured because this event is called uh, Passing the Torch of Success, that would be an appropriate picture. This picture is a monument in, right in the middle of the university where I am the president of. <clears throat> Can we go to the next slide? The next thing that I want to share with you are four what I call key experiences that shaped my personality. The first one occurred in 1965. I was only nine years old. <clears throat> I remember vividly. My teacher came to me one day and she said, there is a student in your class, in our class, who is struggling with mathematics. And as I had told you, I was much more comfortable with math. She said, would it be possible for you to come to school early in the morning, a couple of days a week, for some period of time, to help her with her math? I was honored to get this invitation from our teacher. I gladly accepted. I believe for a period of about three months I did this. Every week, two days a week, I went to school earlier than other students, and I spent time with this young classmate of mine. Her mathematics improved dramatically, and uh, her grades improved. And I remember vividly <clears throat> the day she was from a very poor family. I remember vividly the day her mother brought a tiny little gift that by today's standards wouldn't be worth more than a dollar. I cherished that gift, and I treasured it for a long time. That was one of the most gratifying experiences of my life. And I think I was nine years old when I decided that I want to become a teacher because this was a way for me to give, give back and to get a tremendous amount of gratification. The second important event took place in 1972. I was 16 years old. Remember, I was in that fairly backward education system, but I had one really inspiring teacher. This was my chemistry teacher. Who, um, who was not necessarily a great chemist, but he was a great teacher. And he instilled a lot of good values in us. I remember we had the final exam when our teacher, uh, when the teacher came to me and uh, uh, we were taking the exam. I was intensely engaged in uh, writing the exam and uh, he looked over my shoulder. And you know how it is, you panic at that time. You think you've done something wrong. Uh, but of course, I didn't say anything. I continued to focus on the exam. And he, he bent downward, and he flipped the pages of my exam book. And I said, oh my god, something bad is happening. And then he looked at the other pages. And then he took my exam book, and he said, go. I said, uh, Mr. Such and Such, uh, what have I done wrong? He said, you're too good to take an exam. I'm going to give you a 20. You remember 20 in Iran was, was an A. So this was his way of telling me, you've done a great job. You don't even need to take an exam. That reinforced my confidence in myself about my ability in the sciences. I will never forget that day either. That I was 22 years old when I came to the US, I went through a tremendous amount of hardship. I had no money. I didn't have any knowledge of the English language to speak of. I knew nothing about the American culture. My journey to the US coincided with the revolution. 
The first few years were very tough. But I think as a result of that, I developed a tough skin and I learned how to survive. And in 1994, I became a department chair, and that gave me the opportunity to learn the lessons of leadership. Can we go to the next slide, which is my last? So I promise that I will leave you with a few lessons in life and leadership. These are not intended to be words of advice, but some of you may take them that way. The first lesson is to put your integrity first. There is nothing more important for a man that, than his or her, for a man or a woman, than his or her integrity. Senator Alan Simpson said, <clears throat> if you have integrity, nothing else matters. If you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. I know that I'm running out of time. I, I could have said a lot more about integrity, but I will not. The second thing that I want to tell you is about dreaming big. Life is too short. Millions and millions of people come to this world and leave, and soon after their departure, we forget them. Daniel Burnham, the man who designed the city of Chicago, once wrote in, his, uh, in, in, in the plan for the city, he said, make no small plans. They have no magic to steer men's blood. And then at the end, he said, think big. The third message, don't be afraid of failure. Winston Churchill said, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. For your information, Winston Churchill tried multiple times to be elected for office, and he failed, and he failed again, and he failed again. Winston Churchill was 66 years old when he was elected prime minister. There are many, many more examples like this. Some of you might be familiar with a lubricant uh, spray called WD-40. A lot of people think this is the name of the formula. It is not. WD-40 stands for Water Displacement 40th Trial. The inventor who was trying to invent this lubricant tried 39 times, and he failed. And ultimately, the 40th time, he succeeded. Make friends. This is something that's been extremely important in my life, and I think it would be extremely important in the life of anybody who wishes to succeed. And finally, my biggest advice is, too much advice actually is not good. <laughs> like water, a little advice can sustain you. Too much of it can drown you. So let me conclude my remarks by sending a message that I've been sending my students. And this is for the next-gen young men and women who are in this room. As you embark on your journey in life, work diligently, think deeply, act ethically, fight fairly, but forgive quickly, laugh loudly, love deeply, and always plant more flowers than you pick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nariman Farbardin, one more time, please. Keep it going for him. Keep it going for him. Thank you.